Hello everyone and warm welcome to QuantPi. Today we are going to discuss the Riccati differential equation, an important equation that arises in many sciences, including our beloved stochastics. We will give a quick account of its history so that we understand the context around this important nonlinear differential equation, and we will then discuss the different methods that can be used to solve this equation. Let's see the famous Riccati equation. You can see it's a very, very simple nonlinear extension of the first order equation. It's first order because we only have the first derivative, and the equation is nonlinear because we have y squared. By the way, y is a function of t as well, but we suppress the dependence on t to avoid clutter. So essentially, what this is saying is uh, y is a function whose derivative is equal to a quadratic function of y with coefficients that depend on another variable, say time. You will also see it written in terms of independent variable x as opposed to t, but this is just a presentation matter. Now that you have seen the equation, it won't come as a big surprise if I were to say that this equation was studied and solved in the very early days of differential equations. This is the times of Newton, the real apple guy, Euler, the guy who invented exponential and pi and the Bernoulli's family. These early mathematicians, or shall I say scientists or scholars, used to have their own stack exchange though they didn't have a website so they were executing the same idea using letters and meetings and they didn't have video games in blockchain so they used to play anagrams like when Newton realized that the differential equations is the language of nature he had to post this in the form of an anagram apparently you can construct a lot in sentence out of these letters and which when translated into English essentially means Newton wanted to say that differential equations are useful, though the exact wording differs depending on who you listen to. The reason we have to mention this is because our history of Riccati also involves these exchanges and anagrams. The equation carries the Riccati name only because he was obsessed with this equation. He was communicating about this equation with all members of the Bernoulli's family, and anyone else who would engage, so naturally then people started calling it Riccati equation. It should have been called hashtag Riccati, but they didn't know the meaning of this symbol back then. This Riccati was an Italian scholar who was born rich and didn't have to work. He had to do things that rich people do though, like running his estate and helping the administration, but he refused offers to teach at prestigious universities. He was self-taught in maths. He had studied law but then someone gave him a copy of Newton's book and then Riccati is engaging the whole world. This kind of attitude of studying multiple subjects wasn't uncommon back then by the way. And the journals also used to take all-in kind of approach. So one issue will contain all sorts of things, poems, maths, you name it, it has it. So how did he come up with this equation? He actually saw a slightly more general version in the treatise of an other Italian, Manfredi. Riccati then published a study of a slightly simpler version of the equation, probably encouraged by one of the Bernoulli. The article title was Observations Regarding Differential Equations of the Second Order, which he then reduced to First Order. Seems like he knew how to solve this equation using separation of variables for some values of m, but he wasn't sure of the general solution, so he posed this question in the very last paragraph of the article. And this question itself might have generated the attention that this equation received and led to the association of his name with this equation. The article was followed by a note by Daniel Bernoulli, which gave the solution in the form of an anagram. It's worth highlighting that James Bernoulli had solved this type of equation decades earlier, but the solution was in terms of infinite series, which didn't count back then for their obsessions with elementary functions. But this time, Daniel Bernoulli showed for what values of m can this equation be solved in finite terms, so this was a game changer. No wonder he had to anagram it. 
this anagram wasn't solved. They didn't have the Bitcoin mining technology, but he posted the solution a year later anyways to save electricity. As mentioned before, these guys were studying a slightly simpler version of this equation. So the equation we have is usually called the generalized Riccati equation. So this is not the form that Riccati was obsessed with and the solution methods we are going to discuss have little to do with Riccati's work. But anyways, his name is firmly associated with this form of differential equations. So we follow the crowd here. By the way, this Manfredi's family was also interesting. It was a brother's sister's team. So you can imagine the family dinner usually consisted of equations. So what business of ours is Riccati's? This equation arises when one solves some stochastic problems, say the square root diffusion. In finance, for example, one has to deal with this kind of process in the short rate models of CIR and the stochastic volatility model of Heston. This same equation arises in so many fields, by the way. For example, the calculus of variations in control theory and also in quantum field theory, though one has to add the imaginary I here and there, given the quantum people obsession with the imaginary things. So the equation is immensely important in many sciences. Now just to understand the equation slightly better, let's see how it compares with the other equations. If the coefficient a is zero, then this becomes the Bernoulli equation, which again is nonlinear, but can be easily linearized. We shall encounter this linearization process later on in this video, assuming you're staying with us. And if the coefficient c is zero, then it's just the first order linear equation. Can't get easier than that. Actually, it does because first order constant coefficient equations are even easier. And if you add the cubic term, then this becomes the Abel's equation of first kind. So you can see Riccati got its segmentation right. Any other form in hashtag Riccati wouldn't have stood a chance. Now we are going to discuss how to solve the Riccati equation. There is no general solution of this equation, but there are several methods one can use depending on the situation. You can use the graphical or qualitative methods to get a sense of the solution. Essentially, the Riccati differential equation is describing a function y whose derivative is a quadratic function. So when the coefficients have been specified, then you can easily calculate the slope of the function at different values of t and y. You can then create the direction field, essentially the slope field. So the higher the value the expression on the right hand side takes, the steeper the line segment at that location would be. These curves would be steeper or flatter for other specifications of the coefficients and some or all of these could be downward sloping as well if the values happen to be negative. You can then draw the solution by starting at some point and then following the tangents. And repeating these drawings, you get a sense of the function y. You would have encountered drawing tangents to a curve. Say you have been given a curve. Then it's easy to draw a tangent at any point. So here we are doing the opposite, constructing the curve using the tangents. But then specifying the tangents alone is not enough because the tangent of the same slope can be drawn at different levels. This is a standard thing when solving a differential equation. Different starting points lead you to different solutions or curves. Let's see a couple of examples. So this is how the direction field comes about. There are a few subtleties around how to draw the direction fields, but nothing you can't discover if you try a couple of examples. Leaving the qualitative approaches aside, one can transform this equation into the linear second order differential equation and you know the solution methods for such equations are well studied so this transformation will bring the Riccati equation into the familiar territory and conversely then one can also transform a second order equation into the Riccati equation this is how the story started by the way another situation is if one or more particular solutions of the Riccati equations are known. 
then one can express the solution in terms of integrals. The more particular solution one knows, the fewer the number of integrals one has to evaluate. So if you know one solution, then the general solution will involve two integrals. If you know two solutions, then the general solution will involve one integral. And if you know three solutions, then you will be dealing with just ratios equal to a constant. You might ask, how would I know a particular solution? Well, you can guess a solution in some cases, or use trial and error to find a solution. And the harder you work, the easier the solution would be. Hard work in the Riccati world pays. There are also a number of special solution methods. For example, one can transform the equation into reduced form. And in some cases, one can transform the equation into separable form, which is then easy to solve. You can find these methods in any handbook of differential equations, but we will quickly outline a couple of examples so that you know how these fit into the wider scheme of things. Another special form this frequently encountered, as you would expect, is when the coefficients are polynomial. Again, you can find several such methods in any handbook. By the way, you can also transform the Riccati equation into the Basel equation. Remember, Basel functions. So you can see how the Basel equations arise in the discussion of square root diffusion processes. Let's start with the transformation of the equation into the linear second order equation. First, consider this magic transformation of the dependent variable. It's easy to remember and appreciate when written in terms of derivative of log of u. Essentially, we are trying to get rid of the nonlinear term, this y squared on the right hand side, and the price we pay is we get the second order derivative. So, first order nonlinear equation becomes second order but linear. As we shall see, when we take the derivative of this term, we get a term that represents a square. So the square terms in the Riccati equation vanish and we land in the linear world. Let's see the details. Let's calculate the derivative of the transformation, where we just applied the product rule to product of three terms. First apply the product rule to uv times w and then apply the product rule to u times v. So you get the product rule of three terms. In our equation, 1 divided by c, 1 divided by u, and du by dt are the three terms. Now we can apply the chain rule to the derivative of 1 divided by c and the derivative of 1 divided by u. Essentially, derivative of 1 divided by u is equal to minus 1 divided by u square. Now we can combine the du by dt factors in the last term. Now let's bring down the Riccati equation momentarily so that we can substitute the expression for y and the derivative of y in terms of u, the new dependent variable. So the square terms cancel as expected and the equation simplifies. We can multiply by cu to get we can shift terms to the left hand side and combine the du by dt terms. So the equation has been transformed from first order nonlinear to second order linear equation. And now, depending on the values of a, b, and c, one can solve this equation. And using the inverse of this transformation function, one can go from this linear equation to the Riccati equation. To invert the function, first separate the variables. Remember, c and y are functions of t, so we have function of t on the left hand side and u on the right hand side. Now, du by u is just d of log of u. Now, if we integrate and exponentiate, we get u in terms of y. If you use this transformation, you will get the Riccati equation. So, this close link between the Riccati equation and the second order linear equations one can transform them into each other. Now we have some idea of how this transformation was conceived and you know these guys used to try a lot of things and post the methods and questions to each other so it won't have taken them long to discover the right transformation function. From modern or shall we say more advanced perspective this transformation is relatively easy to find. 
Let's first abbreviate the coefficients. Now remember the similarity matters or group theory approach we were discussing when solving the diffusion equation. It's a more systematic method for solving the differential equations and can be viewed as a generalization of the methods that are very familiar to us. The techniques are advanced, but that doesn't mean we can't cover the key points informally. It's quite an intuitive process, so we should be able to explain how it works. Firstly, it's very easy to see that this linear equation is invariant under the following transformations. So we define a new variable x as equal to t and z as lambda times u. This is one of the elementary transformations. Did we call it magnification? So it is like a microscope that magnifies one dimension. You can write this in terms of exponential, where epsilon is assumed to be very small, so we are talking infinitesimals now. Infinitesimal essentially means infinitely small, which is easy to see when we write this transformation in terms of the infinitesimal generator. The easiest way is as follows. Consider a function phi of x and z, and we can write it in terms of the original variables t and u. Remember, e to the power x is equal to 1 plus x when x is small. Let's get rid of the brackets and the second argument. Now expand using Taylor series up to first order. Remember, epsilon is supposed to be infinitesimal. Now collect the function phi on the left hand side. So this is now describing the infinitesimal impact of the assumed transformation. And if you apply this transformation repeatedly, then you get the finite form of the transformation that we started with. And hence we have the infinitesimal generator, which is nonlinear. We know how to linearize this form. Well, log of u does the job, no rocket science. This is essentially the chain rule why the intermediate variable log of u. Derivative of log of u keeps 1 divided by u. And if we shift the u to the left hand side, we see our generator on the left hand side. And if you now replace log of u by w, we get a linear generator. And if you know the straightening out lemma, then you can do without this chain rule business. So there are multiple ways to get the same result. And we have to transform the equation which is in terms of u to an equation in terms of w. Let's write u in terms of w. So we just exponentiate both sides. Now first derivative is easy, just the chain rule. Second derivative is just the product rule. Now we can substitute for u and its derivatives. We can get rid of e to the power w. And now you can see this equation only involves the derivatives of w. So we can reduce this order by setting derivative of w equal to y. And then the second derivative of w will equal the first derivative of y. So we get the Riccati equation. Now combining the two transformations we used, we see that we had to use derivative of log of u, which is equivalent to the famous transformation, except that we have to deal with the different coefficients. Now this magic transformation function was identified in the very early days of the differential equations by Bernoulli, and then also used by Euler. But as you would expect, this is not the only function that linearizes the equation. For example, if you try a slightly different form, which is like upside down version of the previous transformation, right? Then you also get a linear ODE. There are more such transformations. You can see both are of the form of some u times f divided by g. So you can deduce many useful transformations by playing with this general form. So to transform the equation, we need the derivative which we can calculate by applying the product rule of three terms we saw before. And we can evaluate the derivative of 1 divided by g, which is minus 1 divided by g squared. And we had to use the chain rule as well. Now let's substitute the derivative and the function in the Riccati equation. Next, multiply through by g square to remove the fractions and shift all terms to one side. 
Now you can try to impose different conditions to simplify this expression and you will get the transformation functions that do the magic. For example, you can set the sum of the second and the last terms equal to zero. You can solve this for u times f. And if you then substitute for u times f and the transformation equation we started with, which is the same thing as our original transformation except for the function name g instead of u. And if you set the sum of the first and the third terms equal to zero and then solve for u, then substitute this in the general form, you get the second transformation. Now let's put the transformation side by side so that we can see more clearly. You can try setting different combinations equal to zero and you will get different transformations. Not all of them will lead to a simpler form but you will get some that do simplify the equation. A good coverage is in this paper. Now let's bring down the result of the classic transformation. Sometimes you see that this equation is multiplied by c so that we don't have c in the denominator. Maybe it helps reduce the risk of blow up when c is or close to zero. Now one can solve this second order linear differential equation using some methods cover and differential equation courses. Let's try the simplest case in which the coefficients are constant. It's the most basic equation one can encounter and as you can see if the coefficients are constant then you can separate the variables on both sides and you can use the separation of variables method. But we are gonna use slightly different method just for fun. As mentioned before, it's the most basic equation one can encounter. But used in this context, it will take us a long way to studying relatively advanced stochastic processes. This is a homogeneous second order equation so it is easy to write its characteristic equation. You just choose a name, say M and replace the first derivative by m and the second by m squared. So we have quadratic equation which we can solve for m. And whilst not necessary, we can abbreviate the square root term just to save space. So we have the two roots, the plus and the minus. And as you know, the solution would be a linear combination of the exponential of the two distinct roots times t of course which is the independent variable. When the roots of these equations are not distinct then one writes the solution slightly differently but we have distinct roots so we don't have to worry about those things. By the way even if you forget this method you can deduce this approach by assuming an exponential form of the solution and you will then be left with the quadratic equation because the exponential term will appear in all terms so it vanishes. So we have the solution of u, but we are after y. Not a big deal because y is just derivative of u divided by u times minus 1 divided by c, which is a constant. So we just need to calculate the derivative, which is quite easy because derivative of exponential is its amazing self, and we have to remember the chain rule. Let's factor out 1 divided by 2. Let's bring down the y so that we can make the substitutions. Let's substitute what we have already derived. Now we have the solution which we can simplify. The b divided by 2 appear in all terms, upstairs and downstairs, so it vanishes. Now the m divided by 2 appear in the exponents with the plus and minus signs in different places, so we can't eliminate it completely. But we can simplify it by multiplying everything by exponential of m divided by 2. Now the problem is we have two constants c1 and c2 but the differential equation at the top is first order so we expect only one constant but worry not because we can divide everything by c2 then c1 divided by c2 is a constant and we can call it c3 and we are out of the trouble zone. This constant is arbitrary so we have the general solution and if you have initial condition say y0 equals 0 then you can fix this constant. Evaluate the solution at t equals 0. You can get rid of the terms in the denominator 
and then solve for C3. So we have determined the constants given the initial condition. We can substitute for C3, where we cancel the B plus M in the numerator. We can factor out B minus M in the numerator, and then multiply both the numerator and denominator by B plus M. So we have the solution, but we can simplify it even further. We know m squared, right? So b squared minus m squared is just equal to 4 times ac. Now the two c's can't wait to eliminate each other. We can play with the denominator a bit more. Just add and subtract m minus b. And then factor out the m minus b in the first terms. And substitute this into the main expression and we declare success. Now this was constant coefficients. Other coefficients would require a slightly different approach, but we know the drill now. Now that we understand the nitty gritty of the connection between the Riccati and the second order linear differential equation, how to transform them into each other, and how to solve the Riccati equation through its transformed linear version, let's move to easier methods. First, assume we know a particular solution. You're going to be asking again, how would I know a particular solution? If you stare at a given Riccati equation long enough, you would be able to speculate the functional form of a solution which you can then perfect through trial and error, or you might know the solution through some other sources like books or friends in high places. I know it's not easy, but the rewards are great because if you know a particular solution of the Riccati, then determining the general solution is quite easy. Let's see, because seeing is believing. Assume we know a particular solution, y1. Now consider this change of variable. So we set y equal to y1, the particular solution plus another variable z. Let's remove the dependence on t to save space. Let's substitute this for y. We can expand the square term. We can get rid of the brackets and rearrange the terms. Since y1 is assumed to be a solution of the Riccati equation, the first three terms must equal the derivative of y1. So these terms vanish. And we can combine the terms containing z. Now this is the Bernoulli equation, which is very easy to solve. Divide through by z squared. Now set 1 divided by z equal to u. And then the derivative of u is easy to calculate, power and chain rules. By the way, this transformation we use is a general method for solving this kind of equation. It relies on the mere observation that the derivative of z to the power minus n gives z to the power minus n minus 1 times derivative of z. So you can use this relationship to deduce the form of the transformation that we used. We can substitute u and the derivative of u and shift all terms to one side. So we can write the transitory z in terms of u. And you can solve this equation for u by shifting y1 to the left hand side and then inverting the ratio on each side. Now the coefficient of u, the terms inside the brackets, is just a function of t. So we can represent it by f. To simplify the expression, and you can see the rewards now. We now have a first order differential equation. Remember, previously, when we didn't have a particular solution, we only managed to get a second order equation. And we know this equation can be easily solved by the integrating factor method. The integrating factor is just the exponential of the integral of the coefficients of u. We ignore the constants in the integrating factor, by the way. Notice we left the lower limit indefinite, but it would mostly be zero in the cases we will encounter when dealing with stochastic processes. Now we multiply both sides of the equation by the integrating factor. The benefit of the multiplication by the integrating factor is obvious now because we can combine the first two terms inside one derivative. You can easily verify that applying product rule will reproduce the two terms. And if we now integrate, 
then the derivative and integral in the first term cancel. A true benefit of the integrating factor where c is the constant of integration, you can isolate u on the left hand side. So you can see two integrals now. Remember, we said that if you know one particular solution, the solution involves two integrals. And as we said, and as we shall see very shortly, that uh, each additional known solution reduces the number of integrals by one. So it's only going to get easier from now onwards. Remember, we are solving a first order linear differential equation. So the solution is of the general form. Though it looks slightly complicated because of the integrals. Now we need the solution of y. So we just substitute for u. We can combine the terms. So the numerator and denominator really represent the general solution with same constancy, but the functions of t are different. So think of this as the nonlinear superposition principle. Remember the linear superposition principle, which means that the linear combination of the solutions of a linear equation is also a solution of the same equation. So here it's like a nonlinear superposition principle. And you can also view this as the bilinear transformation of C. Now for practice, could you try to eliminate the constant C from this equation? Start by differentiating this equation and then see if you end up with the Ricasi equation. You should, but you never know. Now assume we know two particular solutions. We represent the first of these solutions by y1 as before and the second by y2. So just as we wrote y as the sum of this particular solution and 1 divided by u, we can write y analogously as the sum of y2 and 1 divided by v. We actually wrote it as y1 plus z, but then z led to 1 divided by u, so this is what we have here. So we can deduce that v will satisfy the same linear equation that u satisfy. Now what do we do when we have two equations? Naturally, we try to add and subtract some multiples of them. No exception here. Multiply the v differential equation by u and the u differential equation by v. Now subtract the second from the first. So the terms containing b cancel. Just for completeness, we can also write v in terms of y and y2. Just like we have u in terms of y and y1. Now this u times v is asking for cancellation. So divide both sides by u times v. Now we can substitute for the reciprocal of u and the reciprocal of v. So the y's cancel and we can combine the terms containing c. Now let's multiply by u divided by v. I hear you, but this is the last of these by the way. So the first two terms really represent the derivative of u divided by v as you can easily verify by expanding this derivative. So everything will fall into place if we just rename this u divided by v. Let's call it w. Let's also substitute for u and v in terms of y's. So the differential equations in terms of w is less intimidating. It's easy to solve as well because we can separate variables w on the left hand side and functions of t on the right hand side. Now the left hand side is just the differential of the log of w. So we can integrate and then exponentiate to solve this for w, where c1 is the integration constant. So we have the w but we are after y. Again easy steps follow. We need to write y in terms of w, so we shift y minus y1 to the left hand side. Next, we collect the terms containing y on the left hand side. Then factor out y and shift w minus 1 to the right hand side. Now we just substitute for w and we get the solution of the Riccati equation, which is again in the same form as in the previous example, but the functions of course are different. And now we have one integral instead of two. So the story holds. When you know one particular solution, you will have to evaluate two integrals. And if you know two solutions, then you will have to evaluate one integral. 
So what happens when you know three solutions then? Before revealing the answer, as if you don't already know, let's try an alternative way of deriving the solution when two particular solutions are known. We know the answer, but we have to do it because this is the approach most textbooks use. They just assume this transformation function. On the plus side, we know how this transformation function comes about as well, so we are in a better place to tackle it as well. So if you can commit this transformation W to memory, then you can get the solution we just derived really quickly. There are several ways to transform the equations in terms of W, but the easiest way is through the logarithms. You take log of both sides, then differentiate, where we just use the fact that the derivative of log of W is equal to 1 divided by W, and we have to use the chain rule as well. We can apply the same logic to the right hand side. Now we know that y1 satisfies the Riccati equation because it is a particular solution, and so does y2. Now it's easy matter to calculate the difference of the derivatives of y and y2. The a's cancel by the way because they appear in both equations of y and y2. Dividing this expression by y minus y2 gives us the first term, and we will get similar expression for the second term. Now the b's and y's cancel, and we get the separable equation that we encountered before, so the rest of the story is the same, and we can skip the next steps. Now we can move to the situation where we know three solutions. As you would have anticipated, getting the solution is gonna get a lot easier. Let's call the first particular solution y1 as before. So the u so defined will satisfy a first order equation as we demonstrated before. We call the second solution y2. And now u1 so defined will also satisfy the same linear equation and so on for the third solution. As all the u's satisfy the same linear differential equation, then we can see that the ratio of their difference will be a constant. Easy way to convince yourself is to note that the general solution of a first order differential equation takes this form, and the same goes for the u1 and u2. So if you substitute these solutions, you will get the ratio of constants, which is a constant, so not much to do then. We need the solution in terms of y though, so let's substitute for the u's. Now we can easily combine the terms in the numerator, and we can do the same to the terms in the denominator. We can take the ratio in the denominator upstairs, which means we have to invert the ratio. Now the y1s cancel, and we also cancel the y2 minus y1 factor. So there you go, we have the solution, which is more obvious when you rearrange the terms and you can easily solve it for y if you like. Now for a final example of the particular solutions method, assume we know four solutions, then we can easily see that the cross ratio will be a constant as we saw in the three solutions case. So this is just like a rearrangement of the previous ratio with y4 replacing y for obvious reasons. Let's verify that this is indeed the case. We know a solution of the Riccati equation takes this form, and we need the difference of the various solutions like y1 minus y2, etc. So let's calculate this difference for two generic solutions, i and j. Now we can combine the two ratios, and then get rid of the brackets in the numerator, hoping for lucky cancellations where we also abbreviated the terms in the denominator because they only differ in C's. Now the F2, F4 terms cancel, and the terms containing F1, F3 cancel. Now we can combine the respective F terms and then factor out CI minus CJ. Now the thing is we have two such terms in the numerator and two such terms in the denominator. So the terms containing f and these will cancel, 
and we will only have the constant terms and multiplying and dividing constants can only give you a constant so we happily accept that the cross ratio of the solutions is constant and notice that this is the same constant for all values of the independent variable so the easiest solution one can get now let's move to some special cases there are a lot of them because this Riccati equation has attracted a lot of attention over the years but we are only going to cover a sample with a view to provide context around the many methods that you can find in any textbook let's start with the transformation into reduced form this magic transformation converts the Riccati equation into reduced form to see how let's calculate the derivative of this transformation so we apply the product rule to u divided by c and we don't need to simplify the last term we can instead simplify the transformation so it's easy to blend into the Riccati equation so we can substitute the derivative into the Riccati equation and then substitute for y on the right hand side we can expand the square term this is a square of a plus b plus c now we can extract the u from the second term and we can do the same to the last terms this extract the multiple u's now we isolate the u terms on the left hand side and then the rest of the term just represents some function of t so we can collect them on the generic function of t now we can get rid of the brackets hoping for cancellations so these terms cancel and these terms cancel as well and we are left with the reduced form of the Riccati equation you can also transform this equation into the second order linear equation so you set u equal to derivative of w divided by w we have seen this transformation before but it's simpler here we need the derivative of u as well which is easy to calculate via product rule now we can make the substitutions so the squared terms cancel and we get we can rearrange to get the desired second order linear equation we can also express the Riccati equation in the canonical form so you just set u equal to minus 1 divided by v the derivative of which is easy to calculate we can substitute these into the reduced form of the Riccati equation and then multiply it through by v square to get the equation in the canonical form which we can also write in the more familiar form now let's discuss a couple of examples of the situations in which the Riccati equation can be written in separable form these are due to Rao and Yukidavi these are special cases and hence the method won't apply generally but if the equation happens to be one of the form assumed in these cases then you can easily solve the equation using the separation of variables method which is one of the easiest methods for solving the differential equations by the way in these transformations we're going to be taking derivatives in square roots etc so we are assuming that these operations are legit okay for the first method Define the transformation by setting y equal to u times v, which are both functions of the independent variable t. Derivative is easy to calculate, we just use the product rule. Now we substitute these into the Riccati equation. We shift the dv term to the right hand side and combine it with the middle term. Now under this transformation, the separation of variables will work if this term in the brackets happen to be equal to a constant time a which is the first coefficient in the Riccati equation and the c times v squared in the last term when multiplied by a constant is equal to the same a you can see these are very specific requirements that would be satisfied in only certain cases but if these are satisfied then the solution is easy as mentioned before let's see let's make these substitutions into the main expression the first substitution is straightforward but we will need to rearrange the second slightly so that it fits the form now we can make the substitutions let's shift v to the right hand side 
Now we need to get rid of V, which we can do by rearranging the second condition to get V in terms of the other variables. We can replace 1 divided by V. We can combine the A's. And you can see we can shift the terms inside the brackets to the left hand side. And we will have functions of U on one side and functions of T on the other side. So the equation is separable as claimed. Now for another variant, let's try a slightly different transformation. So we just subtract B divided by C. B and C being the coefficients in the Riccati equation. We can easily calculate the derivative. We can substitute the derivative and the function in the Riccati equation. Now we get rid of the brackets and the second term and expand the square and the third term. We naturally then get rid of the brackets and the last term. Now the b square by c terms cancel and we combine the terms containing b times uv. Now we shift the terms other than du by dt to the right hand side and we then combine the terms containing u. Now we are ready to outline the conditions required for separations of variables method. Let's represent the sum of the first two terms by h, h being a function of t. Now if we can write the next term in the bracket as some constant times h, and the c times v squared times constant is equal to h, then we are game. To see how, let's make the substitutions. Next, we shift v to the right hand side and factor out h divided by c2. We need to get rid of v as before, so we rearrange the last condition to get v in terms of the other variables and then substitute into the main expression. And you can see the variables are separable. These are just two examples out of many possibilities. I think it would be good if you get some practice. So could you try to show that this transformation proposed by Alan and Stein also leads to a separable form? When you calculate the derivative and then make the substitutions into the Riccati equation, do you get this expression? And now if the coefficients are such that this combination evaluates to a constant, then can you try to derive this separable form? Alan and Stein also give an example of a Riccati equation that satisfies this condition. So could you also verify that the coefficients of this equation indeed satisfy the condition that we outlined earlier? So the recipe is clear then. When you encounter a new Riccati equation, get a table of the special cases from a handbook and see whether the coefficient fit into one of the special form. If they do, then you will be able to use a simpler method to solve the given Riccati equation. If not, then try to deduce the particular solution and then use the methods that we outlined earlier. And if you can't figure out a particular solution, then you can transform the equation into the second order linear equation using the method that we outlined earlier and then solve the linear equation. Another special kind of situation, in addition to the reduced form and separable form, as you can appreciate, is the polynomial. Say when the coefficients in the Riccati equation are polynomial. There are several special methods for handling the polynomial cases. Some of these methods tell you what specific polynomials could form the solution, so you will have to try a small list of polynomials to determine the solution, so you can actually write a procedure for determining the solution. Other methods let you derive a Riccati equation that would have a given polynomial as a solution. You can find several such methods in any handbook, so we are going to skip the details. We hope you enjoyed our coverage of the Riccati equation and we look forward to applying these methods in the future videos.